I hope you can get a sense of what has gone into the kinds of efforts that have occurred here. Uh, this has been unfolding for three years at least, and we're going to hear the parent story on this too, and that's, I think, been unfolding for longer than three years. And um, this really, to me, is, is, a, is an exciting story about both grassroots uh, emergence of, of innovation, but lots and lots and lots of collaboration and thoughtfulness. Um, I know as an educator, um, even in my own classrooms, you know, five periods a day, I knew each class had a different culture. And I knew what it was like in that class that did not have a good culture, how hard it was for me to teach. And I also knew how hard it was, even just in my own classroom, it was to turn around a culture and to get back on the right page and to get refocused on, on what we needed to be focusing on. So those of you who, you know, are excited about what's going on, and hopefully you're all excited about what's going on, um, I hope you realize how much has gone into being able to change um, the kinds of cultures that they're talking about. Um, I also uh, didn't get up to introduce Eric, but I do want to say a couple of words about Eric. Um, First of all, Eric um, was was recently on um, Jeopardy, I believe, <laughs> and I think that's pretty impressive. I think we, <laughs> um, and and you know, a lot of you know about um, NC New Schools from the work they've done with uh, early college highs, and um, certainly that was my first exposure to NC New Schools. And we benefit greatly from having an early college high here on the NC State campus. And what's exciting about how they've grown even um, is that they've continued to, to build on to this agenda of, of innovation in education. And so, so again, this, is, this has been a very interesting in partnership. What I want to start with is I want the panelists to introduce themselves because we have a few new faces here and a few old faces as well. Um, I'd like each panelist to introduce themselves, tell their, of course, name, and sort of briefly about uh, not only why they think they're here, because they're going to represent a constituent, but what their role is in some of the work that's been going on at Nightdale. So we'll let you start. Um, I am actually a member of the, this work group, and I've been really excited to be a part of this work and learned a lot. Um, but also learned a lot through observing this process. Since I am a parent, I'm Shannon Hardy, and I'm a charter school, middle school teacher. I've worked in low performing schools, and I am working at now um, at Explorers downtown, which is a, a really successful charter school that has a lot of freedom to do the things that Wake County is um, giving Nightdale High now. Um, one of the things I just really want to stress as we move forward before I pass the microphone is that. Um, Dr. McFarland will say it's three years, and then Dr. Argent will say it was a two-year process. <laughs> it was an eight-year process. <laughs> and there, I was one of the original parents who started that group, Nightdale 100. And, and I can't say enough about Christine Kushner in the back. Um, Bill Fletcher was key, Tom Benton, three school board members who didn't just dig it out with us um, years ago <laughs> and meet. I mean, I can't say how many times we've met yeah, I mean, how many times we've met, yeah, you, we, we finally got in touch with you five years ago, but there are a group of us eight years ago uh, who parents sitting around, this isn't right, and being a teacher in a charter school knowing we could do better for our children and going to soccer games and baseball games and hearing what was happening and, not, and knowing we could do better. Um, so that it really does come from these different places. A lot of folks will say, oh, it has to be organic and community up for it. It has to come from all those places, the district level, you have to have that school board core group that really believes in that growth mindset. You have to have the, the leadership. I think out of the six principals when you came on, only five, or only one still with us. And they're all, not, not necessarily was that a, an issue with them in leadership, but they weren't in the right place. So they, many have gone on to be successful principals elsewhere, but y you have to have the right leadership for the right job, and then getting the right people on the bus with that leadership. So there are so many levels. Three years ago, we got Dr. McFarland within the first conversation, I knew we were on the right path. And then quickly, he brought in the community and moved forward. But 
Um, it's amazing how quickly things happen when all those other pieces come in together. The only other thing I wanted to stress that came with Ms. Ladd's presentation two sessions ago, but I really want to stress is Dr. McFarland wouldn't have come on if we didn't have that curriculum audit. And I, so over and over, as we go forward in these work sessions, um, the first thing I would do with, with our evaluation of schools and low-performing schools is come up with a system in North Carolina for auditing schools. And I'm Edward McFarland, the Eastern Area Superintendent, and you've heard from me tonight, so I'll pass it on. Well, go ahead and before you do, tell a little bit, you've had a lot of experience as a principal, and, right. and I think that's really relevant to some of the conversations. So, okay. real quick, And I can remember all of it. So, okay. <laughs> so I, I was uh, an elementary school principal and a high school principal prior to coming into this role, and, um, and I always knew that building relationships was the most important job of, of school personnel. The rest of it can happen if you build the relationships. And so that was a piece that I knew when I came on board that I had to do with the Nightdale community because there was mistrust. Um, there was some, you know, some hurting between the community and, and the school system. In fact, I think Shannon probably contacted me pretty soon and, and I knew she was going to be a force to be reckoned with. So I was, um, but we, um, but like I said, we've had tough conversations, um, but we knew what the ultimate goal was. She was passionate about her kids and about education um, for all kids. And, and so um, that's why it was important. Also, I'll say too that this model goes back to what Eric was talking about. This sustainability, when we started designing this um, redesign model, we wanted something that we could take to other places as well. And so we've already moved sort of this model of the community work group and working for a year to the next place in our district, the eastern area, where we're working with East Wake High School. And they're going through the same process now. They've got a design team at the school. They're creating their design team work. And even with the sustainability, we talk about this is only, they're getting major support from central services, but it's three years of major support that then they have to be able to sustain this at the school. And so that's what we're working on also during this time is how do you sus sustain it once the support is pulled back so that this becomes years from now, everyone at Nightdale knows this is how we do business. It wasn't something that was dependent upon a leader or a school board member or a superintendent. This is going to, be, because it is so powerful, no one wants to go back to the way it was before. And that's something that we've tried to build into the model so that we can scale it up and, and, and take to other places that might need some work. Does that suffice? Perfect, Great. excellent. Great. <clears throat> so my name is Dee McKenzie and I actually serve as the Education Innovation Specialists for Nightdale High School of Collaborative Design. That's a mouthful, but I, I work as a Director of Client Services at NC New Schools Breakthrough Learning. And so I, I do want to say this much about um, just the work that uh, Wake County Public Schools as well as um, Nightdale High School of Collaborative Design um, and the community as well, the work that they've put forth. It really made our work that much easier. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that we've gone into um, school districts to provide support and, um, you know, oftentimes hit a brick wall. But um, the environment was conducive so that the work could, could go forward at an accelerated rate. And so, and I, and I attribute that to the leadership in the, in the county. So, um, so again, basically, our role was to serve as a quote-unquote strategist, a thought partner, uh, a sounding board. Jim and I have had some quite interesting conversations. <laughs> and uh, we were able to be just upfront with one another. And what I've noticed is that we've always gone back to this word of relationship. And when I started as a teacher, it was about establishing relationships with my students. When I became an administrator, it was about establishing relationships with my teachers. When I, when I got to central office in Wake County, it was about establishing relationships with those individuals that I was working with. And so now at NC New Schools, it's about establishing relationships with the school district as well as the administration at the school so that we can have those tough conversations. So again, um, I applaud the, um, the school district on the work in the community as well as on the work that they've done. And I look forward to working with uh, East Wake. Awesome. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Shank. I am a current student at, I'm a current student athlete at Nightdale High School of Collaborative Design. Um, 
I'm a, I'm in 12th grade. I've been here. I've been in the school all four years, and I feel that my role is to be the voice of the student body. As uh, we are the we we are the ones that actually have are the key factors of who've been experienced, who've been through, and I've seen major changes in the school. And I feel like I'm here to speak about and express to y'all actually what's happened, what's actually like the effects of it. And I'm Allison Reed, um, and I am an instructional coach at Nightdale High School of Collaborative Design. You've already heard a little bit about me, so I'll uh, pass it on. Now you got to tell your backstory. She made, she made Edward. You got to tell your backstory. Yeah. <laughs> so I was born in 1970. <laughs> <laughs> um, I taught in uh, Winston Salem for Scythe County Schools um, after uh, college. I taught theater and English. Um, moved to Wake County in the late 90s. Um, left teaching for about 10 years, was never ever coming back. I think some of you have heard my story um, before, but I came back in 2011 uh, and taught English at Heritage High School. Um, some people get, I I'll say it, because uh, Ms. Kushner's looking at me. I was Wake County's um, Teacher of the Year last year, um, and so I've had a long relationship with this guy, and so when he was tapped to go over to Nightdale, he and I started, he's, you need to come, we're, we're, gonna, we're really gonna do it. Um, and if anybody can uh, orchestrate great change, I know that uh, Jim Argent can. So came on board this past August um, as an instructional coach to be able to help um, our staff and our teachers make some changes and work with this redesign. And I'm really excited to continue that work. Uh, Jim Argent, principal of Nightdale High School of Collaborative Design. I've been a principal now in my 12th year, uh, two years, a year, a little bit more than a year and a half at Nightdale. Prior to that, I was an elementary principal for 10 years. And uh, Dr. McFarland has to be great with relationships because when I first took over, my wife, who had never met Dr. McFarland, wanted to stab him because the the difference in time. And now through conversations with her on the phone, because whenever I don't answer the phone, she does. She now loves Dr. McFarland. So he's obviously very good at schmoozing people. So you've got Kristen on your side. So they, they collaborate against me quite often. <laughs> okay, I, I just have a few questions before I open it up to everyone. And I, and I want to start with you, Josh. You mentioned you have, is, is it a brother or sister who's in middle school? Um, I have a younger brother that's in sixth grade, and I have a sister that's a 10th grader. Okay, so for your younger brother who's in sixth grade, he'll be coming to Nightdale in three or four years, three years, I guess. How do you think his experience is going to be different than your experience has been? And what do you hope for his experience? Um, the difference, well, will be, I'll start with the institutions, because I'm actually looking forward to him actually deciding, because he's already into cars. And you can see how he has, he's good in math, he struggles in reading, uh, he's good in physical education just as I was. Uh, I feel the difference would be the learning environment and the relationship, gaining the relationships with the teachers. It would be much more like he'll actually look forward to learning because I see like in middle school, um, he has, I guess, since he's, since he's new to it, he's sixth grader, he has certain uh, teachers, I guess, that he doesn't like or he doesn't really feel close to. Well, coming tonight to high school, I feel that with the relationships, he'll become more comfortable with actually learning the concepts and um, actually wanting to come to school. And I feel that he'll actually gain more knowledge from being closer with the teachers. And not only that, with the peers too, and the influence around him will also be a great difference. And since we didn't really explain the Institute model, could you explain a little bit, and then, then maybe um, some of the other folks will explain the Institute model a little bit more, but, but in particular, so as a senior, you haven't been able to participate in the Institutes. Um, how would your participation in an Institute have helped you as you now are preparing to go to college? Um, well, the and, and describe the institutes a little bit for everyone who doesn't, they don't know about the institutes. Well, since I'm a senior, I don't really have, we, we weren't really able to be chosen in a specific institute, but from what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing from the underclassmen, it's, I believe it's three, like three sections of departments and it's like for what you like science and what you want to learn, what do you want to like, um, I say, what do you look like? What are you most interested in? Like, as if, like, if you want to go into, like, I, I want to go into politics. So taking 
like you'll be put into an environment where what you what you need will actually prepare you for college for the courses you'll be taking cuz for an example would be if for if you one of the institutions you would be in and I want to go into politics I wouldn't take a I'll say uh, I'm trying to think of a class that I want to take um <laughs> this is like <laughs> St uh, yeah. Okay. So okay. So you'll say you like the institution will prepare you for cl courses that you actually will need in order to get the major in the colleges that you need. For for well, for instance, uh, our, we have a survey in my AP um, government politics class, and uh, the survey is basically given. We're taking stats on how the students feel about the school and their reactions to the school and if they feel comfortable going to the school, do they feel that they're actually learning more with the school? And if I wanted to go into government and politics, I wouldn't, um, I'm, I don't know why I keep going back to this, but I wouldn't want to take a class that I'll say, AP, like AP environmental, like it's not really my, my, what I want to focus on. But with the institutions, it will put you in those specific courses that would guide you and help you become more successful and gain more knowledge of that specific area that you want to study in so you can become more prepared in it. Not, not bad, Josh. You did a pretty good job with that, considering. So there, there's a capacity. Yeah, you did a good job. <laughs> uh, there's a capacity issue when you redesign. You know, I, I, I use uh, the analogy that I think every human being has like a, an internal rubber band. And it's my job as a principal to know when you're going to snap that rubber band and stop right before you snap it. So uh, uh, I have really high expectations and I push staff, but I don't want to push them past the breaking point. So uh, we, 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 part of our, our, our vision and part of our redesign was to create pathways of interest that are based on uh, research based, a lot of it out of Tony Wagner's work, research based skills and competencies that students uh, and adults need. So we have five institutes. Every freshman goes into the Freshman Leadership Institute. They're in a completely separate area. We treat freshmen differently because freshmen are different. Uh, <laughs> They are. So, uh, I mean, quite honestly, as a former elementary principal, I would rather mix a kindergartner and a fifth grader in a class than I would rather mix a ninth and a twelfth grader in a class. There's, there's the difference in maturity is that, that vast. So we have our freshmen in the Freshman Leadership Institute. They go through several different uh, activities throughout the freshman year to learn about four institutes that they will then matriculate through for the rest of their year. We have the uh, Institute of Government and Global Inquiry, which where Josh would probably land based on his interests. We have the uh, Institute of Creative Design. We have the Institute of Entrepreneurship. And we have the Institute, what, which one did I say? Innovation. Innovation, thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll give a, a, a brief kind of picture of what that looks like. You can apply this to almost anything. So let's take a car as the example. Henry Ford was probably the best entrepreneur in the history of the world because at his market time, if he had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. <laughs> But he was an entrepreneur. He saw a market need. He saw a niche that needed to be filled. He created the automobile. Henry Ford was a great entrepreneur. Someone came along and said, you know what? We just had a traffic-related fatality. We better put some things in place to prevent that. We can't have these potholes. We have to have safer tires. We have to have seat belts. We can't allow people to go to the bar and drink and then get in a car. That's looking at, at a car through the lens of a government and global inquiry, solving problems to make things safer for society. Somebody then came along and said, you know what, that car, that Model T is outdated. We need to make it sexier. We need to, we need to get colors to it. A Corvette was then invented. That is somebody that thinks not only form but function. That is a creative designer. And then lo and behold, somebody came along and said, you know what? We need heated seats. We need air conditioning. We need GPS in cars. That's an innovator. They take a product already made and they make it better. So when a high, school, a high schooler normally matriculates through, they get a course planning guide with about 150 electives. What we've done is let students pick an interest in one of those four areas, and now with their guidance counselor, they can sit down and look, oh, you want to be in, poli you want to be in politics. You want to go through criminal justice to get to that pathway. 
these are some great courses for you within the Institute of Government Global Inquiry. And now all of a sudden we've created choice and voice by the student in the courses and how they matriculate through high school. That's one way that we're meeting an all meets all environment. We started that this year with our freshmen and sophomores. We didn't have the capacity to do it with juniors and seniors. Let me ask a, a question uh, pushing on the personalization. One of the things that was missing, thankfully, was you didn't put up any charts and graphs, and we're kind of used to seeing charts and graphs in, in these uh, sessions, but you didn't put any charts and graphs with, here's where we are now and here's where we want to be. Um, and in fact, you, you described a little bit about how even within the school, you really uh, wrestled with what do we mean about grading, you know, without changing, with, with having high expectations and with having very clear expectations, but still understanding we have to personalize to achieve, allow everyone to achieve those expectations. This is actually an open question to anyone on the panel. How do you want Nightdale to be graded? Well, I would push back a little bit and tell you that we did bring data. Uh huh. This there is, you go. Because this is the only data that matters. Oh, uh, yeah. And so if this could be our model, that then I hope, we're, I hope we're judged by the students and the lives they live and the impact that they make on our community. So one of the things that I think is really important, and this came out of the community work, was um, th the community recommendations were fascinating. I don't think you could have gotten a, a, a group of academics together and created a better um, um, set of, of directives than, than what the community group did. It was, um, they were so informative, so thoughtful. They did their research. But for me, it doesn't matter what the state says about a school. It doesn't matter what the scores say about a school. I'm not really interested in any of that. It's what the community thinks about their school. And if they think their kids are getting a world-class education and they would send their kids there, that's all that really matters in a school. You know, and, and I want to talk about an, 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 a hidden piece of what, how data, if, you, if your value is data, how you can actually harm children. So... In high school, math one, English two, and biology. If you talk to most people, they will say biology needs to be a sophomore course. So most schools put biology in the sophomore year. With the exception of kids that have passed math one in eighth grade because they're smart enough to take biology as a ninth grader. Now let's talk about the unintended consequence you make on students' lives when you make a decision based on, I want to have better biology scores by putting my sophomores in biology. So our biology scores will probably be lower than they could be because state law requires me to test biology by 11th grade. That's, that's my, every, by 11th grade. So if I care about test scores, I'll put biology in 11th grade. But if I care about preparing students for college, I know that if they don't take biology as a freshman, their chances of taking an AP course in sciences is nil. You see, if you don't get your biology course out of the way as a freshman, then all of a sudden your choices shrink, and you all of a sudden don't get to take AP environmental science. Physics is off the board because you lose the amount of time to do those credits. So I want to echo what Dr. McFarland said. And I hope you can hear the passion in my voice because I will tell you that as a leader, I will stand up in front of anyone and I will choose what's right for kids over a report card grade for my school any day of the week. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to, this is why we, we work well together because I always come from this other side of the fence and that is that I have a senior also and she's actually in Josh's um, AP government class. It's this really exciting class and they're doing all the things you saw on the board and asking great questions and designed a survey and had 700 students participate and it just really engaging work happening. But my senior, who I think is in the top five, she, she didn't, she got straight A's her freshman year and then never again because there were, there, it wasn't valued. Grades weren't valued, that work wasn't valued and her work ethic tanked in her three years or in between. And she just got, found out she has straight A's again this quarter, and it's that engaged piece. It, it wasn't she was trying to get A's, it was that she was engaged. Um, so I don't want to throw standards out because I think standards are important. Like I think it's, she, 
she got into UNCW, always wanted to go to UNCW, but I honestly, as her mom, think that she's afraid she's not good enough to go to Carolina or state because she went to Nightdale. And, and as she has said over and over, she's really happy her little brother is going to get a good education. Like she's really afraid that all those years, we, had, we lost 58 teachers <laughs> within the last year, 58 teachers. She had 12 of them <laughs> like, who had to go. So I, I think it's real important that we have standards. We have in a way, uh, some way of holding teachers accountable for their work, that, they, that the students are accountable, that the students know that they can stand up in any other space or environment when they leave. Because otherwise, they just think that they're a camp. Like they, it just feels like, yeah, we had a great experience and we're doing these things, but how do I know what I can do out there? And it's really intimidate, intimidating for them when they're first generation college students or when their parents aren't driving RTP. You know, and then their parents are counting them to go and break through these barriers. And being a first generation college student myself, I can say, like, I knew I went to a good high school. I, you know, I knew where I stood. And I think it's really important that we don't just throw standards out as we move forward. That's not just about affirmation and, and project based work, but there's also there's some accountability. So one of the, an, another issue that ha, that you all brought up that is also a conversation we've had over and over again is with regard to sustainability. And we've seen a lot of data about uh, school improvement um, approaches where you're identified as a failing school, uh, you're given resources, you maybe even start with all new faculty and a new principal, and you work like crazy, and you get off of the you know, low achieving school list, and you go, whew, and then, you know, it all goes to, you know, where. Um, you all mentioned that part of your sustainability was who would want to go back, you know, that, that you really develop, if you really truly develop this culture, then it's going to be sustaining itself as, as you go along. Um, the question is, how do you get to that point? And, and, and I know this isn't a formula. If it were, you could make a lot of money by just selling it, because uh, there'd be a lot of people willing to pay for the formula. But but how do you help the lowest achieving schools um, across the state develop the kinds of plans that you've put in place that will stay in place? Um, I'll actually say something about that. I will say because the change this year and the start of last year. Um, a, way, a good way to start it would be the relationships. And with the relationships being said, it's for uh, being, like, being more comfortable for the students and teacher, you, for the students to be more comfortable with the teacher and the students being, and the um, teachers being more like getting to know their students and getting to know their environment. And that's what brings us to the, uh, like we have, like in the beginning of, I remember the beginning of each semester, um, new class, new people. Do you see your? You say you see your peers, and you see your old friends, and you see people that you've never even seen before. And what we did was, um, we started like little campfire groups to just to get to know. And we, every like every single day in each, every single day in the class, you would switch with people that you've never seen to the point where. I think we did it for what two weeks or one week, or two weeks. Uh, took the time out just to get to know who you were working with because it's it's hard to be in an environment or actually accomplish something when you don't know the like it's it's awkward when you're working with somebody that you've never even seen before so the fact of actually being able to understand them know even to clear them down to know how they feel like what makes them happy what disturbs them it brings a better learning environment and then um i'll say uh at, at the end of the two weeks we kind of made um what, what is it called the the um the, the social contract, and what the social contract was, was basically, as a class, we made basically the rules. Because there was no, there was no, um, when we, normally, like, uh, the year, previous years, it would be like, the teacher's like, okay, you can't do this, can't do this, you can do this, but you can't do that. But this time, it was, what do you, what do you want the rules to be? How do you want to be treated? How do you feel? How do you want the teacher to be, treat you? How do you, um, how do you think the, how do you think you should treat the teacher? And even on how do you th what do you think should happen if there was an altercation or anything if you was to break the social contract, and in each class it's different, just varied off just because nobody's the same, everybody's different, and with and each class it's like its own unique culture, 
and you group in it's a different environment every single time. And each social contract, even even my class, every social contract is different. Yes, you have like the basic, the respect, the kindness, but then you go on to the different some people like um some classes you would be there like just depending on like the group of they'll say that people are more open minded or honest or they'll like they'll go deeper and of course there's maturity and in and even the teachers like the teachers would give parts and then we said if you, they were repeated in within the groups, then they would put check marks on it. So it's like you would be even more on it and um, more in depth with that, or you'll look forward into that. And I feel that if you have a relationship with the teacher, you'll actually be more focused and more intertwined with what you're actually learning. Because for stu as a student, like what well, nowadays, well modern day, if you don't like the per if you don't like a teacher, you wouldn't want to listen to them what they're saying. But the fact that when you actually are comfortable with them, to talk to them, and you actually understand them and you, you get to know them, it's like you actually listen and pay attention to what they're saying. So, thank you for that. It's my theme music. <laughs> Boys, don't you? We're not going there. All right. So, so I... Th I truly believe that school districts, like Wake County, they have to be willing to take risk. And, 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 and I'm just going to be honest and upfront. I do understand that there are some school districts that have, um, quote unquote, more than others. You know, they, the, the amenities are there. They have, they have the budget that they can work with. And, and I know some, some school districts don't have that. But in that, you have to be willing to take risk. And taking risk doesn't always involve money. So you have to be willing to think outside of the box. And in doing that, you must always keep students first. And in doing that, you have to look at relationships and relevance. So, and, I th and again, I think that is one of the reasons why we've been very successful. When they first came to the table, they were focused on the student. How do we make education relevant? How do we establish those relationships with students? So if school districts are willing to think outside of the box and to go into a school and say, hey, if you're not interested in what we're doing, then you can choose to go somewhere else. I mean, how many school districts in North Carolina do you think would do that? Not many. Probably not even one. <laughs> one did. One did. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then to, to bring on people who buy in to the concept. And buy in is imperative if you're going to have sustainability. So, and you're, you must be willing to make that investment in the beginning and know that there's a return on your investment in the beginning. So I'm willing to put out the money because I know that in the long run, I'm going to be able to keep this going because teachers aren't going to want to leave. They're going to stay. If a teacher feels that they're valued at a school, then they're not leaving. It's not about the pay. I feel that I'm valued in, the, in this particular culture I'm staying. And so now you've got the return on your investment. You've got the sustainability. You don't have to be concerned about hiring new staff and different things like that three years, four years, five years down the road because they're still there. So I think that's, that's, how, you, um, that's how you acquire that sustainability. Just to um, piggyback on that real briefly, I think in addition to that and what Josh was saying, the question was, you know, how do you sustain this and how do you build this as a model for other places. And I think one of the really important things that you have to allow schools um, to have is time. Um, there's that, you've gotta have that capacity to take some risks, but then you actually have to give them some time before there's another new initiative next year. Right. Because if we expected this, you know, building culture takes time and sustaining culture. If you want it to be sustainable, you know, you have to move slow to Go fast, go slow to go fast. I got that all backwards because I never like to go slow. But building culture takes time, and and the the um, the luxury of time and patience to develop to develop that culture is huge. And being able to develop leaders through that, and taking the time to empower teachers and leaders to grow that, is important as well. 
I spoke to a teacher two weeks ago, and the teacher from Night Hill, and the teacher said to me, you know, I asked him how it's going. He said, I am exhausted. <laughs> and he said, this is the most exciting work I, I've ever done. And he said, I've been waiting my whole career for a job like this. I think that's how you sustain it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I just want to add one more thing. Um, I think it's really important that um, we, we continue with our conversation on how to identify learning as growth. Um, I think that as long as we're identifying growth as learning, then those teachers are getting that affirmation for their work. We're not looking at proficiency numbers, we're seeing growth. Um, and then the other piece that I would, just sort of an assumption that I would love for us all to operate on as a state, and as, since I have a few state legislators in here and a couple of school, school board people, I really um, think that people want to send their children to community schools. <laughs> Like, they don't want to go to a magnet school. They don't want to go to a charter school. They feel like they have to because the community schools aren't being grown and nurtured. And so I, I just really want to emphasize, being a charter school teacher, um, how it, it's really been a, a journey for me that we can do this. What, what's happening in charter schools, we can do in our communities. Um, and the other thing I wanted to bring in is something that Nikki said last week when we were sitting together. So I want to call you out, Nikki. Um, she said, why is anyone talking about race? <laughs> And I thought that was a really important and profound thing. Um, we've had an extraordinary, extraordinary um, experience at Nightdale, and you know our family is a minority at Nightdale High, and it's been absolutely extraordinary. Um, right before Dr. Argent was hired, um, a school board member um, said to me, not one in the room, um, but said, "I'm, I'm a little concerned. I think he's the best person for the job, but how do you think the community will accept him because he's white?" And I was, I was like, look, you know, I know the parents in our community. I go to baseball and basketball and soccer, and, and I've been to church. They want the best principal and the best teachers for their kids. And this is not about race for them. It's about the best. It's, it's, it's us at the other end that make it race. They want the best for their kids. They want their children to grow. They want their children to be known as individuals. Um, all of us, I do, that's what I want for my child. And that's really what's happened. And I've just, these are like incredible conversations as a parent. I've heard from my daughter have happened in the last year with teachers um, that have really breaking, broken through those barriers. And, and now with Trump, <laughs> that, that, that conversation's even deeper um, because it's all out there. So I just, I think those layers have to happen as we go forward. I could ask a million more questions, but yeah, maybe you want to start with the very first question. I'm gonna open it up to everyone. Well, since I was already called out, I'm yeah. Matthew Charles. <laughs> and I actually, I think the conversation was around what kids need. I think you asked the question about do you, do you think you need to have a faculty member or a teacher of color in order to, to do good work? And my, my response was no. I think the piece about race is more structural for me. I think operating under the idea that it doesn't matter in terms of structure I think is a huge mistake, especially in a state like North Carolina. I'm a recent transplant from Philadelphia and certainly there are similar issues but also, I think, some very unique circumstances here. But I wanted to hear a little bit about, I think Dee and I, we had this conversation in our last study group um, around rigor and what that means. We're talking a little bit about tracking, in, in essence, uh, providing access to accelerated honors, IB programs versus how we track kids in the special ed and what that means at Nightdale. So we, uh, all students, go into honors classes, non-negotiable. Uh, we do provide at the end of each quarter an opt-out for parents, but it's not an easy opt-out. Uh, we make sure that when we talk to parents, if you're gonna opt out, that the reason they're not being successful is not an effort issue. Uh, because we don't want to connotate that academics means easier, because an academic level class still needs to be rigorous. Uh, what we want to ensure is that we're providing as many opportunities. We have a we have a goal that we're creating, um, that we've created. We call it our, our three by nine goal. And what we mean by that is that every student will have the opportunity to take three classes that will equate to nine college credits, whether they be the college to career promise uh, classes through Wake Tech, whether they become AP courses that they take and get a three or higher so that they could potentially get credit for college courses through AP, and or, or if it's actually taking classes here at some of our local universities. So we feel very passionately that um, research does show that if you have an opt-in you capture way less than if you have an opt out. So we're not giving them the choice. They're in honors. And we've had a couple parents argue with me about that. 
and 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 I've I've had to you know say well I respectfully disagree but I'm going to give your child a chance I'm sorry you don't want to but I'm not going to tell your child they can't learn at this level then at the end of the quarter if they're not performing well we have some crucial conversation as to a why and then b we give the parents the opportunity to opt out at that point and and we had 95.1% of our classes passed in the first semester. And it's important, too, that they're going to be much more likely to perform at that higher level of rigor, honors, AP courses, if they feel like they are in a place where a teacher has their back and where they, they that teacher believes that they can do it. That's that mindset. That's how all those pieces go together. But we know that if we just led with rigor before relationships, we would not have nearly the gains or nearly the sustainable gains over the, over the long haul. And I think that's one of the things that um, Nikki and I talked about as far as the importance of ensuring that there are academic supports in place. Mm -hmm. And I think you all definitely do that. Make sure well, and, you and speak to that. So with new schools, we're gonna go visit a, a district in Texas that does some similar things. Uh, we're, we're thoughtfully taking our intervention coordinator because we recognize that intervention coordinator doesn't need to be just with students that are struggling to pass courses. We need to have our intervention coordinator and an intervention plan for students that are struggling to pass AP or College Career Promise courses. So we don't want to just say, okay, now we got you in an AP class. Good luck. We have to we have to scaffold and differentiate in that class also. So our intervention coordinator is going with us on our trip to Texas so that we can pre create structures to support kids in honors and AP classes so they are successful. And and I'm just going to say that part of their their intervention structure is about accelerating kids. Um, in some places and in many mindsets, um, when kids don't get a skill in third grade. They're damned to eternal remediation for the rest of their time in school because they can't say all of their multiplication tables from memory in a certain amount of time, maybe in third grade, they can never do anything success successfully. And then on school has changed, and that's what we have to understand. When I was in kindergarten, I colored. Now in kindergarten, we ask kids to explain their thinking. We ask them to go much deeper. So it's a different world, and we have to change many of our practices within the school. And so they're really targeted about how they take heels and kids and look at their skill deficits and look to accelerate them because maybe they have a deficit in a skill area but they can still think on an 11th and 12th grade level and that's what we have to realize a skill level doesn't mean a cognitive dysfunction we have to know the difference I wanted to thank Nightdale for representing Wake County Schools so exemplary um, but, and I think you exemplify why we have to defend support and transform our public schools I also wanted you to highlight what happened the, um, in your first years as in, to your graduation rate, because we did not let go of standards. So I wanted to have Dr. Argent talk about that. Thank you, Ms. Kushner. Uh, Put you on the spot. Our, our graduation rate last year went up 7.9% uh, percentage points. Percentage points, sorry. Um, it went up that much because. Uh, some was low-hanging fruit. Some, some was very low-hanging fruit that we cleaned up data. You know, we were we were tenacious on data, so we, we want to make sure if we're going to be judged on graduation rate that we were using the right data. So, so that was a little bit. Some of it was that we wouldn't let kids fail themselves. We refused to let the teenage mind get in the way of their future. So we dragged some kids back into school. Uh, uh, we had critical conversations with students. We had critical conversations with staff. We ensured that every single staff member followed board policy to a T. So when board policy states that you have to have a remediation plan that uh, addresses the, uh, extra time and support for students at risk of failure, and as teacher turned in a list with failures on it, we would ask them, well, where's your plan for extra support and time? And if they didn't have one, we made them enact it. Uh, so we took... Uh, we identified 88 seniors at the beginning of the year that needed eight or more credits to graduate. Uh, 87 of them graduated. We provided after school tutorials, we provided Saturday school, we put them in grad point credit recovery. We did everything we could to ensure that they were successful and walked in their ropes. We, um, we created a situation where Dr. McFarland had to provide a lot of cover for the angry parent phone calls he got because I refused to hand out graduation robes to kids that were not on track to graduate. And they wanted to say, well, I paid for it. And I said, yes, and I'll tell you when you can get it. You'll get it when you prove that you're a graduating senior. Right now I'm treating you as a junior because you're not passing. 
We took away lunch privileges. We did everything we could, and we had some people mad, but it was all worth it when we had those same people that were mad that hugged me on graduation day and thanked me. So it was tenacity. It was that mindset. I expect over the course of this next several years we'll be able to eclipse that pretty easily because of what what the relationships we've already built and uh, the preventative measures we have all the way down in ninth grade. Um, I have a quick question. You did get some extra money. How much do you think you could have succeeded in what you're doing without the extra money? And what types of innovations and um, things, did, flexibility um, things, did you put into place that didn't cost you a thing that you found to be successful? Well, I will say quickly, the extra money um, wasn't about stuff in the school. We felt like it really had to be about um, a couple of, of, of key um, strategic areas. And one was professional development. And, and really, it wasn't that much. We, we, we tried to get a, uh, an extra month for every teacher. Um, but, you know, we, it did get pulled back to two weeks. But still, that's powerful for a teacher that you get 10 days of professional development that you get paid for that kids are, and you don't have to stay at night and you don't have to come on a Saturday and not get paid for that. And so that was really, that was where most of the money went. I mean, there, there was a, 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 you know, a small amount that was there for, you know, just some tearing, you know, some furniture and tearing out the locker bays to make collaborative spaces and that sort of thing. But most of it went to the professional development time to pay the teachers. The innovative work that happened there came from the teachers yeah. and, and from support from North Carolina New Schools. So, so you, you asked, I, I, I think the, the most important aspect of the redesign was not necessarily the money but the ability to have flexibility with letting teachers opt out because mindset is free. So having a growth mindset and being tenacious doesn't cost a dime. So to have, and, and, and to steal Shannon's words from earlier, the right people in the right place at the right time. We have the right people because teachers that didn't want to do this had the ability to opt out. And, and I'll tell a story that, that there was a teacher that opted out that I was very sad, very sad. And I wanted to talk her into staying, and I decided not to. The last day, she's packing up, she's leaving, it's the last work day, and I say, uh, I'm going to miss you, think you're a great teacher, wish it would have worked out better. And she looked at me and she said, I love the ideas, I just don't think it will work for these kids. I've never been so happy that I didn't talk her into staying. That's a mindset issue, and I don't need them at Nightdale High School. And I don't mean to be mean about that. But I need somebody to say, it is a privilege to work here. I want to be here because we're making incredible work for kids that deserve it. So I'm not going to lie to you. It's nice having it. But that's, it's, it's, it's a, a want, not a need. The mindset is the need. Um, I hear so much about how you are working. It started, well, it started from the community. How is it adversely now affecting the community, the high school, and what impact it's having on your community? Um, well, it's a, it's a good problem. <laughs> so actually, Rodney Ellis was here earlier, and he, um, his wife emailed me, and she's like, do you have any pool? We have these friends. They want to get into Nightdale High, and they couldn't get in. Um, so I think it's turning um, in our favor. Um, you know, there are a lot of pieces. It's not just the high school. For us, the Nightdale 100 started. We wanted our town schools to be successful. And so there are four elementary schools, one middle school, one high school. They were all on different um, schedules. I mean, there were so many issues and layers there. So a family would, could have a child in three schools and, and two or three schedules, depending on how things were going. So it, that stuff is real, that coming is coming together. Community and schools came in, and there's a corridor from elementary to high school. We've done a, a lot outside of just Nightdale High. Uh, Nightdale High is important to me because my daughter is now a senior, but I have a seventh grader, you know, and we, we were in the elementary schools. Um, so that's important. Um, the other piece for me is our sort of motto that every school in Nightdale is the first and best choice for our families. And I think, that's, I think that's a state thing. I don't think that's our town. I think everyone wants that. Um, 
So that equity. Yeah, and I'm going to echo what Shannon said. I know we're talking about Nightdale here, but a lot of the work from the community group, um, we are doing uh, some innovative work in the elementary schools in the area as well, and in um, starting some work in the middle school. We have a middle school now that we're forming a, a design team in, in the middle school that's going to begin some work moving forward um, with this, you know, so that we have this K-12 initiative. And why is that? Because one of the things that came out strongly from the community group um, in their recommendations was we want some clear K-12 pathways that, that are consistent. And so, you know, some of the stuff they're doing at the high school, we now have happening in some of the elementary schools that will now be middle school and then into. So this is, truly is impacting all schools. It's not just Nightdale High School. How is it impacting the community? And how is it changing the community for the better? Or well, I thought you meant first. Okay. I mean, I can give you anecdotal. You know, I don't know that I have um, any of, of, of hard numbers that you might be looking for. But I know now I get calls from people that just to call and tell me they're happy with what's going on in their community and that they're satisfied. The mayor, um, you know, was, I met with him when I first came there and he was very ardent about, we have to make some changes. No one wants to build a house in the Nightdale community and, and housing is changing and, and um, you know, parents are, are, are happy. I'm hearing good things from the community. I mean, we, we there are still issues. I don't, I don't, you know, this is not Camelot. There is still work to do, um, but the, there is certainly um, a positive energy about the work from the community. I can get some, some data. So some of the data we were using to advocate for this redesign as parents um, were things like real estate, the number of students going to magnet schools or charter schools or homeschooled. And so I think it was at one point a third of the family, the children in Nightdale were not attending Nightdale schools. Um, and those families are coming back. So for instance, and I just use our community swim team, which has 100 kids on it, you know, as a sort of a barometer. Um, when my daughter was a freshman, there were only two of those high school swimmers that were going to Nightdale High. They were all, everyone else was going somewhere else. And this year, all of our high school swimmers go to Nightdale High School. So that, and this is the first year. So that, I don't know if that. Oh, sorry. Uh, you, uh, you referred a little while ago about sustainability with your teachers um, and that if they felt valued in the culture, that they would stay, uh, which I think is uh, something our legislators and others who are, are calling the shots in education today uh, don't really grasp that that's how you retain your teachers, your best products as teachers. Uh, but I would say to you, and, and I agree with all the things that you have said about your graduation rate, I would say to you that the exact same concept happens with graduation rate, that if those students feel valued in their school, your institutes that would prepare you to go on to Absolutely. a government and politics, that, that I am valued, I belong, they believe in me and my ability to become whatever it is that I'm, I'm destined to be in my future. Those things raise your, gra your true graduation rate. And those things also contribute to the positiveness of your community because when those students have had that experience with those teachers who feel valued, they are more likely to return to your community and give back to that community in their career and college that they have experienced. So it's, it's a circle of, that everybody is included there. So that graduation rate, I think, I think this is the key to a true improved graduation rate and not all of the games that so many people try to play to, to get the data to look like we had more graduates. But this is a true graduation rate. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in how you change the relationship model. I mean, I sort of imagine the old school teacher, you know, student down here, teacher up here, authoritarian, know-it-all, and somehow you've intervened to create a different model uh, that apparently is the, the beginning of, of the new Nightdale. What is that new model and how do you bring about such a great change? Well, I think Jim um, spoke just a little bit about a program that we went with and not to market theirs, but it's in, in my career as a teacher, um, it's been probably the most thorough and comprehensive professional development program I've ever been to, been to that 
taught teachers how to develop relationships. Um, I mean, it's pretty cool. Some examples, some, some specifics of what that looks like. When our bell rings and, our, and we have class change, our teachers, every one of them, tell me if I'm lying, are standing outside of their classroom and there is a handshake, we're making eye contact, how are you doing it? It is a barometer before they walk in the door. That is an expectation of every teacher, every class, every time. Josh mentioned the social contract, which we're asking the kids to establish. So this is our community. How should it work? How can, and, and it's a contract, which is a business term. Um, we're using a bi appropriate business communication here. They write those contracts. When Dr. Argent and I go in to visit a classroom, and I think you guys have probably experienced this as well. When I enter a classroom that Josh is sitting in, I didn't write that contract. What happens, Josh? Um, we have uh, uh, students or specific students who actually introduce them to the classroom, show them about, tell them about the social contract, and then we actually have them sign it and let them become a part of our classroom. So when I enter his classroom, that's his classroom. That's their classroom, and I've got to agree to abide by the rules of their contract, to, and they will stop instruction to make sure that I understand their social contract. And when we have visitors in our building, that is what they do. So those are some of the things that we've kind of made relationships systemic um, and clear it. Well, and, and I will just say too, this was, this was intentional, the work that they did. It was three days of grueling work in the summer that was not about curriculum. It was not about instruction. It was really psychology based on how do you build relationships with people. And, 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 and everybody had to attend you know, from the front office staff to the teachers, it was, you know, and this was everybody. It wasn't just a, yeah, it wasn't just including me. I mean, it was a group of people. It wasn't just 10 teachers that went to this and then they were supposed to go. Everybody had to commit to this and um, and it, it sort of breaks you down, you know, and, and I can tell you the difference in a, the school now when I walk in, when I walk in now, I have kids come up to me that will ask me if they can help me. They will reach out and shake their hand. What high schools do you walk in in, in you know, the country now where that happens on a regular basis? It's, it's significant. And, and the, 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 one of the, the big keys is the accountability piece that we provide as, as uh, an admin team. I mean, I, I don't mean to be, to be rude, but you would have to be pretty dumb to not be clear on our expectations for building relationships. It is in every email we send out. It is in every meeting we do. It is absolutely. And so what ends up happening is when a student sees a teacher violating our procedures, they will be in my office within 10 minutes. Dr. Argent, so-and-so didn't do this. That's not part of our school culture. They didn't honor our, our social contract. We had a sub that said, told a group of students they were going to take the social contract down. I got a phone call. Dr. Arge, you need to get down here. The sub's taking down a social contract. I walked down to the room. I thanked her, told her I would pay her a full day, and I sent her home because she refused to follow our expectations. The kids were, like, blown away that I did that. And I looked at them and said, I will never let anybody mistreat you. And the students know that about me. Uh, the last thing is we model it as an admin team. So high school students do not like throwing away their trash. I don't know why, and it drives me flipping bonkers. <laughs> so one day after lunch, they left it particularly messy this year. I got on the loudspeakers and was not very capturing kids' hearts. I was not very kind, and I let our entire school community have it. You're being pigs. I don't appreciate this. You need to take pride. Clean up after yourself. Yeah, I mean, I went off. I didn't get around the corner before I hear my receptionist cackling, laughing so hard. A student called the front desk and said, I need to speak to, Mr. to Dr. Argent. I'm calling a foul on him. I'm not a pig. I clean up after myself. So I talked to the kid, and I said, you're absolutely right. I hung up the phone and did another all call, and I apologized to the entire school community, and I gave them affirmations because that's part of the process. I modeled for them. I can't tell you how many students came up and thanked me for that, but it also showed the teachers that we meant business when we were talking about this. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to make mistakes. So you talk about how it's a toolbox, and it could be any toolbox, but it's the explicitness of it, the thoroughness of it, the accountability of it, and the modeling of it, and being humble enough to know as, as the principal, you know, there are times that I throw myself under the bus. 
just so that teachers can see that it's okay to make mistakes and then you bounce back from them. But Josh, you, you remember that day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and it, it's a work in progress, I have to say, too. I, I went to, they were doing a, um, they just had a meeting um, recently where they came back together, just kind of um, say, okay, now here's where we are with Capturing Kids Hearts, what's next? And I can't tell you how powerful it was to sit in a room of 75 teachers for a full day and not once did a single person complain about their kids. These darn kids, if I just had a different set of kids, what I could do. That was not spoken the entire day. It was about what we can do to make our place a better home, and that is powerful. Uh, um, with with what Dr. Arden said, it was like it was very very mind blowing once he said it, and then the fact that so many students gained respect for him, and not only that, with the capturing the kids' heart, it also takes away the rebelliousness from the students. So it's like. You wouldn't, because you didn't like that teacher, you wouldn't be with, like, you wouldn't be in class and, like, you won't put your headphones in. Just that you won't purposely try to ignore them just because you won't like them. You would actually feel, like, more comfortable with them to want to listen to them, to want to hear what they have to say. So, and yeah. students call fouls on each other. That's yeah. a great piece of it, too. <laughs> yeah. I'd wonder if you could talk about business involvement and support. Okay, I get it, yeah. So uh, we have a great business community in Wake County. We have uh, the Wake Ed Partnership, which is a nonprofit that, that connects and works explicitly to connect with a uh, business community. North Carolina New Schools has an amazing uh, business connection. Uh, we have started uh, cultivating business partnerships, and what, we, what we're asking businesses, we're taking a completely different approach. We don't want money. We never hold our hand out. We ask them for time and talent. We want time and talent. We want time and talent. We want time and talent. So um, our business model is with our, uh, we have a very small, highly functional uh, business uh, uh, alliance board. And we meet monthly and we have teachers come in. And what we ask for our business alliance board members is to be willing to do some legwork and make connections. So when our teachers have needs, they bring very explicit needs to the business community. And if the people on the alliance can't meet that need, they have contacts. And so they'll go in. And so we have uh, our Spanish teacher wanted to have a mini business fair to show our students the power of being bilingual. And so we now have next, the week after spring break, we have a bunch of businesses coming in and talking about the marketability that they will have if they continue their Spanish education. This is a, someone that would go to the top of a resume list. So we're having, and, and she just went in. And so we're making those connections. 2.0 of, of that is to start engaging businesses in how to help lesson plan. So what is a real world problem you would you would have in your business and let's create a project-based learning scenario around that let's please uh give our panelists a round of applause thanking them i'm sure they can be around for a few minutes if you have some questions just as a reminder joe sent out an email today about the uh, upcoming writing sessions you're not expected to attend all four writing sessions. Um, and I think he made it clear you sign up for one or the other and one or the other. And so if you have any questions, as always, because uh, we're, we're now kind of winding down. Um, it has certainly been, been my pleasure, and, and I'll speak for Greg as well. Um, this has been a learning, community learning opportunity for all of us. And, and I think we've all really grown tremendously in being able to have wonderful experts come in and talk about innovation, talk about addressing some of the most intractable problems. You know, I'll go back to No Child Left Behind. No matter what you think about that legislation, it pointed to some real needs for us to make differences in kids' lives. We haven't made a lot of progress in 15 years. Um, in, in some ways, and uh, I think this is a real opportunity for North Carolina to lead the way. So thank you again for being here, and uh, again, let's uh, thank our, our panelists. <laughs>